Good afternoon. My name is Susan Derwin, and I am the director of the UC Santa Barbara Interdisciplinary Humanities Center. Our center serves as the public face of humanities for the campus, and our programs aim to deepen our understanding of the challenges we face as local and global citizens and prepare us to address those challenges in informed, impactful, and compassionate ways. I'm very happy you are able to join us for today's lecture, and it's wonderful to see that we have audience members from across the country. Today's talk is part of the IHC's public event series, Living Democracy, and it is co-sponsored by the Sarah Miller McCune and George D. McCune Endowment. Throughout the year, scholars, activists, and writers and artists taking part in the Living Democracy series will examine the forces that weaken democratic culture and the conditions under which an equitable, vibrant, and just democracy can thrive. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to make sure that our audience is aware of the question and answer function on the screen. Audience members can submit questions to our speaker in English or Spanish at any time during the event, and when our speaker concludes his presentation, he will answer as many of them as possible. And I also want to clarify for the audience that this particular uh, event is a webinar, which means that unfortunately we do not have the ability to have the audience interact directly with our speaker much as we'd like to be able to do so. So please do submit your questions and we will answer as many as we can. I also want to extend our thanks to the Spanish interpreters for this event, Professors Viola Milio and Alini Ferreira, as well as to the ASL interpreter, Katie Voice. Thanks go, as well, to IHC Associate Director Aaron Nurstad, Assistant Director Adam Morrison, and Senior Artist Paula Schaefer, all of whom work very hard to make our events run smoothly. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Archon Fung. There you are. Archon, hey. Archon Fong is the, the Winthrop Laughlin McCormick Professor of Citizenship and Self-Government at the Harvard Kennedy School. He has been on the faculty of the Harvard Kennedy School since 1999, having earned two Bachelor of Science degrees in philosophy and physics and his PhD in political science from MIT. At the Ash Center for Innovation and Democratic Governance at the Kennedy School, he co-directs the Transparency Policy Project and leads democratic governance programs. His research explores policies, practices, and institutional designs that deepen the quality of democratic governance, with a focus on public participation, deliberation, and transparency. He has authored and edited nine books, including Full Disclosure, The Perils and Promise of Transparency, and Empowered Participation, Reinventing Urban Democracy. It's an honor to welcome Professor Fung to the IHC to present his lecture, From the Embers of Crisis, Creating Equitable and Deliberative Democracy. Hey, thank you very much, Susan. And thank you, uh, everyone else on the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center team at uh, UC Santa Barbara. I wish I could be uh, in Santa Barbara with you to, to talk in person. Unfortunately, the circumstances obviously don't make that possible, but I'm delighted that we could gather here and have this conversation virtually. Uh, and I'm really uh, happy that uh, people have joined to have this conversation about democracy at uh, this particular moment in our nation's history. We're a little bit less than one week, about five days out from election day 2020. This is the most significant election uh, in my lifetime and perhaps the most fragile American election for uh, many decades. So I will not uh, talk about uh, specific election challenges. There are plenty, plenty of places to have that conversation. It's a very important one. But I want to step back a little bit and uh, talk about the times, the how to think about the democratic challenges that we face on a more long-term scale. Uh, many people feel that we're in a crisis of democracy now. I think that democracy faces many, many challenges right now. Uh, hopefully we will surmount some of those challenges next week, but many of the deep challenges will certainly remain. And so these remarks are intended to provide a way of thinking about the challenges to democracy that we currently face, the big ones. And then also in the second part of the remarks, 
I will talk about, offer what I regard as the three most important priorities for establishing a deeper, more equitable, and more egalitarian democracy. Uh, so the uh, starting point, in case you haven't noticed, in case you haven't looked around, is that uh, times are changing in many, many ways from the past. And so I want to characterize for you how I think they're changing in ways that are very significant to uh, the health of our democracy. In a stylized way, I want to argue that the decades before uh, the election of President Donald Trump, many decades from maybe 1980, 1975, up to the Obama administration, the end of the second term of the Obama administration, I think you can think of as a time of relative stability. And stability has, uh, can be, uh, has some positive features, but also some negative ones. And I wanna talk about uh, both the positive and the negative. And I wanna begin by characterizing that period of relative stability as a period of narrow aperture, liberal elite consensus. And I will unpack those words in uh, just a moment. But kind of moving on, something happened uh, in the United States, but also in Europe and many other parts of the world in 2015, 16, around those years. And in, in our country, in the United States, it was marked by the election of Donald Trump uh, in England. It was marked by the success of the Brexit leave referendum and the defeat of the Remain side. And it was also marked in parts of Europe and Latin America and India by uh, the rise of what some people have been calling uh, populism. And so I want to characterize the period that follows 2015-16 as a period of wide aperture politics. That, and I'll talk about what the difference between narrow and wide is. And then the question, several questions, what comes next? And what kind of politics will we have? And can we, will we have the political will and the wherewithal to create a deeper democracy out of these wide aperture times? So uh, first, a, a word of explanation. Some people, uh, younger people in the audience may not know what an aperture is. An aperture is a hole, oftentimes referred to in the era of mechanical cameras. And a wide aperture is when the hole is big and it lets lots of light in. And a narrow aperture is when the hole constricts and lets only a little bit of light in. And so how was 1980 to 2016 a narrow aperture time? It was narrow aperture in that capital D Democrats and capital R Republicans, for the most part, certainly at the national level, but at all kinds of other levels, agreed on a lot. There was a relative consensus on the desirability of globalization and free trade, a consensus on liberal democracy, not only in the United States, but the role of the United States in spreading liberal democracy around the world. This wasn't something that Democrats and Republicans argued about. It was something that they agreed on, although they argued about how exactly to accomplish those things. It was an era of welfare reform. The, uh, there wasn't an argument about expanding social programs. It was an argument about how much to contract them. There was an argument, there was a consensus on free markets and also at that time, there was a relative, at least in the discourse, a consensus on racial and ethnic inclusion and meritocracy, regardless of race or uh, gender. Uh, one way to think about the narrow aperture world, and I think some people in the audience will uh, remember this phrase, Margaret Thatcher, very important prime minister of England for many years, characterized the era of, of, as one in which there is no alternative. That is, there is no political alternative to this consensus that I laid out about liberal democracy and free markets and a relatively constrained role for government. Um, after she was prime minister, uh, in some press reports, and you can kind of look this up, evidently in 2002, she participated in a dinner party in which one of the participants asked her, this is a, a dinner party in Hampshire, United Kingdom, evidently, one of the guests asked her, she, they said, uh, he said, Lady Thatcher, what do you regard as your greatest achievement? And Lady Thatcher responded, 
Tony Blair and New Labor is my greatest achievement. And uh, for those of you who don't uh, remember, Tony Blair was a transformative leader of the British Labor Party. And so he was the one uh, who most prominently transformed the classic Labor Party into so-called New Labor, the third way, uh, much as uh, President Bill Clinton was a New Democrat, Tony Blair was the New Labor leader when he was prime minister. And Prime Minister Thatcher, Lady Thatcher, regarded Tony Blair and New Labor as her greatest achievement reportedly because she won the war of ideas. She said, we forced our opponents to change their minds. Whereas labor, prior old labor, classic labor had favored a program of uh, national ownership, uh, strong trade unions, a very generous social welfare state. New Labor renounced many of those principles to join this narrow aperture consensus that I, uh, that I laid out in uh, this slide. Okay, so if that is a narrow aperture, what is a wide aperture? What, how to think about the times that we're in? Uh, I think of this as a wide aperture because many, many ideas, both on the political right and the political left are up for debate and on the table for political discussion in ways that they simply weren't in that narrow aperture consensus period. It's not that there weren't any people who held a wide aperture beliefs, there were, it's just that those people were very much on the margins and not really admitted to um, polite political company, if you like, or the halls of power, uh, if you like. So what's included in that wide aperture? Well, right now there's a live debate between globalization and national uh, sort of America first or Britain first, marked in the UK by the um, Brexit, by leaving the European Union uh, and uh, in the United States by a policy of renegotiating many trade agreements and insisting on an America first kind of policy. Uh, one of the candidates in the presidential primaries um, and on the Democratic side, Andrew Yang, proposed a universal basic income, which I think would have been uh, a stretch, uh, more than a stretch in the period from Clinton even to Barack Obama. Uh, there is serious talk of uh, trust busting now in which, a way that there hasn't been in a long time, even talk of a wealth tax. Um, and of course, there are serious debates about ethno-nationalist policy, in particular with regard to uh, immigration. There is a wide, wide range of views, wider than in Europe, I think, on climate change and the facts or the uh, reality of climate change. And in the immediate moment, you can see this wide aperture reality in the very, very polarized, politically polarized approaches to uh, handling COVID-19, the appropriate public health and economic policies with regard to the current pandemic. Another way to think about this is that uh, if many of these ideas on the right, if you had suggested building a wall between the Southern part of the United States and Mexico, and on the left, if you had proposed a universal basic income or a 2% wealth tax, if you had taken those ideas into the West Wing of the Obama administration in the first or second term, I have a fairly high level of confidence that uh, people would have snickered a little bit and then they would have laughed and then they would have escorted you out of the room, not because they disagreed with those ideas, but because those ideas weren't even worthy of serious discussion. But all of those positions now are serious debated positions in, um, in, uh, by some major, major political figures. And so that's the sense in which this era that we're in right now, this moment that we're in, I don't know if it will uh, last long enough to be an era, is uh, why I regard it as a wide aperture moment. So where do we go? Um, I want to suggest, I don't know where we go. I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I did. Um, but I want to sketch out four possibilities. And these are not exhaustive possibilities by any means, but I think that it helps to sketch out some scenarios to be a little bit more precise about what the future might hold for us. So one possibility is authoritarian decline. 
And there have been a lot of books about this possibility. Uh, in particular, uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Steve Levitsky and Dan Ziblatt uh, wrote a, a very important book, How Democracies Die. David Runciman has written um, uh, another book about the democratic malaise and the decline of democracy. And there are very many different scenarios for what democratic decline might look like. Uh, and some people have even suggested dramatically that uh, that we may not be able to manage a successful, peaceful transition of power in the 2020 election. That would be the most dramatic version of it. But there are many other slow burn versions. So that's one possible future is authoritarian decline in the United States. Another possible future is purgatory. And by purgatory, what I mean is that this wide aperture moment that we're in, 2016 to 2020, kind of continues, that the range of political debate is very, very wide. People really, really disagree with one another. And so we see these kind of big swings and deep, deep uh, disagreements, anxiety-inducing disagreements, even for people who don't follow politics very closely, are getting a headache because of the wide aperture times that we're in. And so the second possibility is that these wide aperture times just continue, that things don't really settle down into a new normal, that this is the new normal, as crazy as that may uh, seem. A third possibility uh, which I'll call the empire strikes back, is that we return to this earlier period of genteel liberal elite consensus that uh, on this picture here, Donald Trump, Brexit, all that is an aberration. It's a kind of norm breaking moment. It's a fever and pretty soon the fever will break and things will tur turn back to normal. They'll go back to the way the things were in say the George Bush, Bill Clinton, uh, Barack Obama kind of period. Um, and, and so will uh, politics will narrow again to something like this liberal elite consensus, although maybe the, the details are a little bit differently. But the point is it narrows down and settles down to the politics that many of us grew up with. So that's the, the third possibility, which I, I'll call Empire Strikes Back. And when I... Um, gave this, uh, the, the, was talking to these, uh, about these ideas with a friend of mine who uh, had worked in several administrations in Washington. He said, well, I don't know why, it wasn't so bad then. Why do you have to call it the Empire Strikes Back? I think of it as Return of the Jedi. And I think that's a pretty good point, right? People have different views of this gentle liberal elite consensus. It had a lot going for it. It was uh, stable. People didn't wake up every day uh, anxious and fearful about the political news. Uh, uh, I think probably in that era, the pandemic policies would have been more effective, or at least there would have been more agreement on what the problem was and the range of solutions was. was. There was certainly less polarization. So maybe, maybe the right way to think about that is Return of the Jedi and not Empire Strikes Back. It depends on your perspective. And then a fourth possibility is a deeper democracy. And uh, I'll sketch out in a moment what I think some of the problems of that genteel liberal elite consensus were. I think you can probably imagine some of them. But I think it was pretty problematic from a democratic perspective and that democracy could and should be much, much deeper. And so a fourth possibility is that we, uh, we uh, emerge from this period, say in the next five or 10 years, with a reinvented, much deeper, reconstructed democracy. All right, so those are my four scenarios. And what I wanna do now is invite a little bit of audience participation. In, in particular, I want you to um, pick which of those four scenarios you think we're most likely to be in in the medium term frame, say in the next three to eight years, just to put a number on it, three to 10 years. Do you think that the scenario is more likely to be authoritarian decline, purgatory, empire strikes back slash return of the Jedi, or a deeper democracy? What do you think? And so now you should see a poll on your screen 
And uh, please respond to the poll. And I'll leave it open for some number of, uh, you know, probably for a minute or two should be plenty of time for people to vote. The votes are coming in. Um, that's 20 people have voted. Those who haven't, uh, please pick your choice. And then I'll show you the results in a minute. And then uh, remember what you voted and perhaps we can revisit these choices in the Q&A. So you got 70% have voted. So I'll wait just about another 10 or 20 seconds and then I'll close the poll. If I had some Jeopardy music, I would play it. All right, so most people have voted now. Um, and here are the results. So almost a majority, 50% of people who voted think that the most likely future for us is purgatory. And then uh, next up, uh, only half as many, a quarter of the folks thought that it would be a return to the narrow aperture, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi world. Uh, and then the third choice is, author is a deeper democracy with 21% uh, of folks. And then only one person uh, was uh, deeply pessimistic and thought that the future held authoritarian decline. Uh, this is pretty interesting. Uh, most uh, So when I was first developing this set of ideas, I really didn't consider purgatory to be a very plausible choice because the times that we're in just seem, seems like everybody has a sense of vertigo. Like how could it stretch out with this level of continuing disagreement? Um, it seems like it has to settle down into something. But when I've presented um, this set of ideas to different audiences, most people, the, the plurality answer is purgatory. Most people um, that I've spoken to about and framed it this way seem to think that we'll kind of continue in this state of um, dizzying disagreement about uh, where the country should go and perhaps even what the world is like and what the basic facts are with, um, with a big, big phenomenon like a global pandemic. Um, all right. So those are the poll results. Um, okay. And we can return to those uh, toward the end, but I just wanted to get your sense of where we we're going and to get you to engage with those four scenarios. All right. So why is the wide aperture a crisis? So you, you might think, well, okay, things are wide aperture, people have lots of different views, but that doesn't necessarily imply that there's a political, social, or democratic crisis of any kind, right? But uh, I believe, I suspect a lot of people in the audience feel that there's something of crisis proportions going on. So here's a way to think about why this wide aperture world generates the kind of crisis that many of us feel like we're experiencing. The first dimension of the crisis is a social crisis, a crisis of polarization. And the country has been polarizing for quite a long time. So this is a poll question back from 2014. Uh, as far as I can tell, they didn't ask a more, didn't ask this very question more recently, but I think it's a good one to capture the level of antipathy that's out there. They, uh, the pollsters at Pew asked, how do you view the other party? In particular, do you view the other party as a threat to the nation's well-being? And 20, this is before Donald Trump was elected, 27% of Republicans at that time saw the Democratic Party as a threat to the nation's well-being. And 36% of Republicans saw the Democratic Party as a threat to the nation's well-being. So those are large sections of America that view the other side as existentially threatening. That's, uh, that counts in my mind as a social crisis. Here's a more recent question that's um, a little bit less serious, but they asked, uh, the pollsters at Pew asked um, 
Republicans and Democrats, people who lean Republican and Democratic, who are looking to get into a relationship, who are open to the possibility of a romantic relationship, would you consider a, being in a committed relationship with someone who blank, voted for Clinton, voted for Trump? 75% of Democrats or Democratic leaners, 71% uh, would not consider being in a relationship with someone who voted for Donald Trump. And the figure for Republican leaders, uh, re Republican leaners for people who voted for Hillary Clinton is 47%. So um, it hasn't been always the case that our political preferences have been this important in our personal lives, uh, but they figure very, very importantly. Another way to look at it is our political leadership. This is political polarization in Congress some decades ago in the uh, 1973 to 75, um, Nixon thereabouts. And uh, on the, the left, little blocks are uh, more liberal members of Congress and on the right are more conservative members of Congress. And if you look at this, you will see that uh, something like 80% of the members of Congress at that time were purple in the sense that 80% uh, was between the most conservative Democrat and the most liberal Republican, right? And then, so what does it look like today? In 2017 to 2019, there are exactly zero purple members of Congress. There are no members of Congress between the most liberal Republican and the most conservative Democrat. That's uh, a big uh, zero. If I can get the annotation, I won't. Uh, I won't torture you with the annotation. Nobody is in the purple zone right there. Um, okay. And so the polarization and the wide aperture leads to a series of institutional crises of delegitima delegitimation, and the problem is that what democracy depends on, if you think about it, democracy is kind of a miracle every time it works because what it depends on is different sides who have deep beliefs and differences about where we should go as a society, agreeing after an election is held, among other times, that the results of the election are binding, that I have deep beliefs about what I think will be just and fair and democratic in America. Other people have different beliefs and democracy requires that if they win the election, I just take it and I abide by the results of the election. It's kind of a miraculous accomplishment every time it occurs, but it's a little bit less miraculous in a narrow aperture world because lots of people agree on both things. But in a wide aperture world where there's intense and wide disagreement, successful democracy becomes more miraculous. And so uh, at this moment in the United States, I think that wide aperture difference, we're really stretching the, um, the boundaries of what these institutions can take, right? And so institutional crisis, uh, we can look at a lot of the institutions are under a lot of stress now in ways that they haven't been because the views are so far apart. The electoral question, will Donald Trump leave office uh, peacefully? Uh, as I said, there's been uh, a few books on this topic and numerous articles. It's a question that there were very, very few articles and books on this topic in the last five or 10 presidential elections because it just didn't come up. The Electoral College has been an unpopular institution for many, many decades. My uh, colleague, Alex Kazar, just wrote a fantastic book, The Definitive History of the Electoral College called Why Do We Have the Electoral, Still Have the Electoral College. It's been deeply unpopular, but it hasn't risen to the level of salience that it has in recent years uh, in the 2000 election, of course, but then also right now, especially. The Supreme Court is under a huge amount of pressure, um, as I'm sure people have been following with the, the death of Justice Ginsburg and the, uh, and the confirmation of Justice Barrett recently. Uh, uh, many America is divided about the process of that selection and confirmation. What you may not know is that Justice Ginsburg herself who is widely regarded as a liberal lion of the modern Supreme Court 
was confirmed by the Senate with, I believe, a 97 to 3 confirmation. And Justice Scalia, one of the most conservative members of the modern court, was also confirmed, I think, with a 96 to 4 Senate vote, right? So the Supreme Court just had a higher level of consensus support, even though these particular justices uh, were widely different in terms of their political ideologies. It was a, the institution, there was just a lot less hanging on, on, on the institution. And now its legitimacy is hanging by a thread because people disagree so much. So the picture that I've been walking around with in my head lately of American democratic institutions is that our democratic institutions are like a pressure cooker. And when the heat is low, and it's just a simmer, things are fine. And that narrow aperture world is just a simmer. And the institutions are fine. There's no question of the pressure cooker failing or, or even making much noise. But now the pressure is turned way, way up because people disagree with each other so much because we're in this wide aperture world and the political institutions may crack and indeed, I think uh, some of we may, I, I guess I think that we're beginning to see one of those, um, uh, some of those cracks emerge. So why are we in this situation? And wouldn't it be better to return to that narrow aperture world? I think it wouldn't be. I think there was a democratic rot associated with that long narrow aperture period. And I just wanna bring out two aspects of that rot for you. The first aspect is that it was not, I believe, government for the people. This is the first figure for, uh, of a best-selling book from a, a economist, Thomas Piketty, called Capital in the 21st Century. Uh, those of you, probably many people in the audience bought that book. This is the first figure from the book. And it depicts income inequality by looking at the share of wealth, of, of income, I'm sorry, of income uh, commanded by people in the top 10% of the income distribution. And what you'll notice is there was a period in the mid 20th century from 1950 to 1980 in which the top decile controlled a relatively low portion of the national income year to year. But then after 1990 or after 1980, where I mark that narrow aperture consensus, right? Income inequality starts skyrocketing. The people in the top 10% of the income distribution end up commanding more and more of the income in America. This is just another way of working, of looking at it. This black line here is the uh, top 10%, top 20% of the income distribution. And you can think, well, it, uh, it's not really government for all of the people in the sense that a government for all of the people would have benefited everyone. It was government for these people, which are the uh, top 5% of the income distribution. They did a lot better in this period from uh, 1980 to now, a lot, lot better. That's one dimension of the rot. Wasn't government for the people. Second dimension of the rot is that I don't think it was government by the people either. What does government by the people mean? One thing it means is that government is responsive to what people want. And so uh, this is the a kind of uh, simple definition of responsiveness. Um, so responsiveness it happens, a responsive government is depicted by this green line. And what that means is when a lot of citizens want something to happen, government's more likely to do that thing. But when few citizens want something to happen, government is unlikely to do that thing. And an unresponsive government is just a coin toss. Government doesn't care what citizens want. If lots of people want something to happen or if very few people want something to happen, it's kind of random what government does. And so a uh, political scientist named Marty Gillins at U now UCLA wrote a very important book called Affluence and Influence in which he looked at several decades of legislation and tested this hypothesis is how responsive is the federal government. And he looked at issues on which people who are relatively better off have different uh, political preferences than people who are relatively less well off, right? And so uh, wealthy people have different preferences from poor people on issues like taxation and the generosity of social benefits and regulation. And what he finds is that uh, for the middle of the income distribution, for the average American, government is not at all responsive. It's that red line. 
So uh, not good news for the, those of you who would like American government to be by the people in the sense of being responsive. However, kind of good news, policy does track some citizens' views. It tracks the views of the top 10%. So what Marty Gillens did was he looked at what the top 10% of the population wanted out of public policy, and he found that uh, government was quite responsive to people at the 90 per 90th percentile of the income distribution. So it's kind of government by and for the top 10% of the income distribution. And to my mind, that constitutes a kind of democratic rot. And so that those two characteristics um, kind of describe the narrow aperture liberal genteel late elite consensus of 1980 to 2016. And indeed, I think it's that rot that generates the wide aperture. People want a different set of options, a different set of leaders on the table because government for those last few decades was not for them and it wasn't by them. So how do we make it more for government by the people and for the people? How do we deepen democracy? And I want to offer just three priorities here. And there are lots of different ways to get to these priorities. Um, but I just want to, democracy requires a long agenda with many items. But these are three that I regard as particularly important. The first is full participation. Every American should participate in the political process actively. In 2018, or I'm sorry, in 2016, 55.7% of, of uh, voting age of the uh, voting age population in the United States voted in that general election. This is uh, very low by international standards. A uh, lot of countries, most countries uh, with uh, democracies that have been around for a while do much better than us. And indeed the United States is 28 out of 35 in the OECD uh, on voter participation. It's a uh, very poor showing for the beacon of democracy. There's lots of ways to get to full participation. Some of them are familiar, like automatic voter registration. Some are becoming more familiar because of the pandemic, like vote by mail. I, uh, along with many, many other people, have favored an election day holiday. I'm told that we, act, we vote on Tuesdays because it used to, people used to go to market on maybe the weekend or on Monday. And so they would be able to spend Tuesday to vote before they left market with their goods and returned to their houses. Um, that is an antiquated reason to have elections on a Tuesday. I think we're some, some, some years, some centuries beyond that reality. Another uh, important um, aspect is a full social mobilization. I believe that companies, schools, and schools, both at the primary and secondary level, in terms of getting students ready to become citizens who participate, and colleges and universities, uh, in terms of uh, getting their students to actively participate at the ballot box, and many civic organizations should be actively involved, fulfilling their democratic responsibilities in getting people to participate in the political process. And uh, this time around, in the last couple of elections, you see lots of companies actually uh, taking on this democratic responsibility. So uh, for the past few elections, uh, Patagonia has closed on election day because its CEO said that democracy is more important than shopping. It's a proposition that I happen to agree with. I hope you do too. But Patagonia is one of the usual suspects. Now, lots and lots of companies have joined pledges like Time Out to Vote um, uh, and, uh, and other efforts. The big three auto companies, because of a collective bargaining contract agreement, now uh, hourly, I think it's hourly employees in the big three all get election day off to vote and conduct um, participatory activities. And uh, two colleagues, E.J. Dion at the Washington Post and at Georgetown University, and Miles Rappaport, who I have the good fortune to work with at the Ash Center, led a working group to explore what they call universal civic duty voting, which is the Australian. They have it in Australia, they have it in Brazil, and a few dozen other countries. The idea that voting should be mandatory, legally required, 
and that not voting should be sanctioned um, with uh, perhaps a modest fine or penalty. And so um, they uh, have done, I think, a great service. And I think that this will be, uh, this proposal will unfold and get attention and debate both pro and con in the years to come. And I think it's a, uh, it's a, a time to consider ideas outside of the box ideas like that. The second priority is fair advocacy. Now, voting is about individual participation, but I, I think we all, political equality also requires group, uh, uh, some fairness among groups and advocacy, right? So how public policy is made is not directly by citizens influencing government usually, but by citizens working through groups that influence government, like the National Rifle Association, like Black Lives Matter, like the Sierra Club, thousands and thousands of others. Now, the problem with the advocacy system is that not everybody has an equal chance to have a group that advocates for them. So a couple of political scientists, a few political scientists, Keish Lozman and Henry Brady and um, Sid Verba, um, did a study and they didn't look at all groups. They looked at groups within Washington, within the Beltway. It's an important subset of groups. And they said, okay, well, this is what America looks like, okay? So if you look at all Americans, 8.5% of us are executives, 13% are professionals, 14% are white collar workers, um, and so on. And 35% of people are out of the workforce, right? And so they asked, okay, if that's what America looks like, what does the group structure look like? If you just look at the groups in Washington, whose interests do they represent? And this is what they found. It's amazing. They found that 70% of groups in their reckoning represent the interests of executives who constitute 8.5% of the population, right? And so if you kind of break it out, 78% of the people, white collar workers down to people not in the workforce, 78% of Americans get 6% of the groups, right? So you can think of political inequality, voting is unequal because people have more money and people have more education, vote more often than people who don't. But that level of inequality pales compared to the inequalities in the group structure. And so what we need, the second priority, democratically speaking, is groups for everyone. And how can we get closer to that? This is harder, but some of the policies that might help are lobbying and finance disclosure. A universal public service core, I think, would help a lot because then you'd have all of these young people doing public service and, and groups out, community organizations, other kinds of groups would be getting their labor and their help. And so expanding their group power through public service folks, support for community-based organizations. And I think very, very importantly, enabling worker organization. And a couple colleagues of mine over at the law school, Ben Sachs and Sharon Block have written this great, they led a great project talking to labor unions and lawyers and lots of other folks on what the future of worker power look like, should, uh, might look like. And they produced a great set of recommendations here. I encourage you to check it out, Clean Slate for Worker Power. And for those of you who are interested in um, groups, you know, this group analysis here, in California, there's a great, you're living through a great example right now in Proposition 22, which will uh, reverse the uh, legislation that classifies uh, Lyft and Uber and rideshare drivers as employees. And Prop 22, right, the, the sides that want to reverse that, of course, are the, the big rideshare companies like Lyft and Uber. Um, I've read news reports that they've raised uh, something like $120 million for the $150 million for the campaign to get their side of it, right? So they've, they've, they're, they've got a big group with well-funded, but the people who want to maintain the idea that these drivers would be um, our employees have raised much, much less, I think, uh, with outside support on the order of $10 million. So that is not a fair fight. So um, whatever you think of uh, Prop 22, I encourage you to uh, participate in that decision. It, it illustrates perfectly the importance of group power here that I'm making. Okay, and then finally, inclusive politics. Um, this one is, uh, I know, this one is more controversial even than the first two. And so 
here I'm thinking, what does inclusion look like for a wide aperture moment, right? So we know the 2006, 70, uh, 2016 to 1976 politics was this um, two-party world. But what does a wide aperture politics look like? I think one way to think about it, and I'd be curious what, what you think, is that the 2020 politics and on in the United States, at least for a little while, might consist of these people who used to think they were on the opposite sides of the spectrum, never Trump Republicans and establishment Democrats, they probably have more in common with each other than with a lot of the other political forces. So I'm gonna group these two, the capital R's and the capital D's, and just call that the establishment. So that's kind of one political force that might be out there. And what I see in the future, and who knows, I'm probably wrong, but this is one possibility, is that it's a three cluster world with the establishment being the first cluster and the second cluster being a post-Trump right. So who are the inheritors of um, Trumpian, it's not conservative, kind of the uh, Trumpian right politics and those are people, I think, who favor public policies that are maximally support, supportive to families and community, traditional families and traditional communities who want to discipline and break up big tech, who want America first in the world and are not interested in globalism. That's a second poll. And a third poll is democratic socialism. And those folks want more powerful unions and more and better popular organizations, much more, much more generous social protection. And they, like some of the post-Trump right, would like to break up big tech and big companies. And they have a cooperative security kind of foreign policy is it's not backed on America having the biggest, toughest military, but cooperation with other countries. And you can name the inheritors of these politics. It might go, establishment might go from Joe Biden to Kamala Harris to Pete Buttigieg, perhaps. Um, the post-Trump right might be a shift from Donald Trump to maybe Josh Hawley or Tom Cotton. And then democratic socialism might be the leaders might move from a uh, Bernie Sanders to a Liz Warren or an uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. And um, I think that, I, I guess I'm playing with the idea that an inclusive politics is one that would be able to include all three of these views. And probably a lot of people in the audience, or at least some people in the audience would like to exclude one or other of these polls. But part of the thesis of this wide aperture reality is that it is a reality and it's very difficult to exclude people because they have uh, beliefs that are very different from yours and even exclude them because they have beliefs that are anti-democratic. I think it might be more fruitful to think of a democratic structure in which the people can decide. And so I think of that as a multi-viewpoint democracy that's very different from a two-party democracy. And so a multi-party democracy, what might be some of its features? It would be injecting a lot more proportional representation into the United States political process so that these different views could uh, get their own bases of support and jockey and deal. And I think that as a result of that, we uh, would likely see some moderation on the post-Trumpian right for, I mean, who knows, but, but that's, I think that would be one possible consequence of this kind of inclusive politics. And so it would, uh, some of the measures might be ranked choice voting, which exists in Maine is on, is on the ballot here in Massachusetts, cumulative voting, party fusion, we can talk about what that is, multi-member districts, which are required for pr pr proportional representation, top two primaries, which you have in California, and then also in mechanisms for intra-party democracy. How do you have the left and right of the, Demo or the left and center of the Democratic Party really be able to uh, get influence over the party proportionate to their popular support? And what can you have part, uh, democracy within parties as well as between them. I've been taken by a book that's a couple years old now that explores that uh, this problem of the two-party system. I think it was a book kind of in some ways before its time, very informative um, that explores ways to uh, both the pathologies of this two-party system, but also how we might get to a multi-viewpoint democracy in the United States. Um, all right. So that, uh, just to leave you, those are the three priorities that I have 
for moving toward a deeper, more deliberative and more equitable democracy. Uh, you may have others, and I'm, I'm sure there are other very important agenda items required to reinvent and reimagine our democracy. I think the important thing is for all of us to be deeply invested in the twin projects of preserving the democracy that we have, such as it is, but then also reimagining and reinventing our American democracy so that it can deliver on the promise of uh, more equitable participation and influence and better democratic deliberation. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, Arshan. Um, I'm going to jump right into questions uh, because we don't have that much time left. The first is from an audience member writing from Utah who says, I was struck by your purple zone congressional slide and the absence of centrist position. Here, Mitt Romney, Republican senator, and Ben McAdams, Democratic uh, uh, House, uh, House of Representative member must walk very fine lines to maintain a balance and neither are viewed as deep red or blue by the local electorate. Yet it would seem that there is no purple in the purgatory you've presented. Is that correct? I'd appreciate your observations and he loves your or she loves your work on transparency. Oh, thank you very much. That's so kind. Um, I, I think it's many important points in that comment. One is that the texture of local politics can potentially be very different from national politics in that national politics in this highly polarized time um, is about taking up sides and local politics can be, uh, I think, much more about problem solving if it's not polarized. The trouble is that a lot of the national polarization is boiling all the way down to the local level. It's gotten um, so intense. So, um, so that's the, the local federal point. I think it is very, very different, uh, difficult in a wide aperture moment. Well, in a two party wide aperture moment, I think it's very difficult to operate in that purple zone because the pressures for polarization are so, so great. And there's, you know, political scientists talk about two different forms of polarization. One is issue polarization. You know, you, you, are pro-choice or you're pro-life or you want higher taxes or lower taxes. But right now, what we're seeing in addition to that is what they call affective polarization, which is how much, primarily, how much you don't like the other side, right? It's about affect and emotion. And that is an intense and very, very powerful force right now that drains all, that, that makes it, I think, just about impossible to operate in that middle purple zone, very, very difficult. One advantage, I think, of this multi-viewpoint democracy of a kind of proportionality and uh, beyond the two-party system is that the purpleness would be much larger because people would be doing different deals and making uh, strange political bedfellows across. So for instance, I think you might see uh, parts of the far right and parts of the far left being in favor of a more generous social policy and a jobs program in a way that the establishment, as I characterized it, would be opposed to, right? That would be kind of a strange mix. At least now it's hard to imagine because of our two-party configuration, but it would be different if it were multi-viewpoint. Okay. Four minutes, five questions. Here you go. <laughs> Number one, uh, many great ideas, but since these different groups see politics as a zero sum game, how does the theory deal with the group that overall refuses to share with others? Others. So if there's multiple groups, part of the one that doesn't share, so what, the one that doesn't share with others gets locked out because they're incapable of making coalitions and expanding their base. Um, in a two party world, one can plausibly not share if you have a majority, it's a majoritarian system and you can freeze the other 35 or 40% out. Um, and that's a big problem. <laughs> okay, if a citizen wishes to abstain in an election and live with the majority's choice, why shouldn't he, she, they be allowed to do so? Ah, so this goes to the Australian Brazil, you have to vote or you get a speeding ticket. And it's very important in those systems that you be able to pick none of the above or write in or Donald Duck or whoever you want. And in some of these proposals, all you have to do is go. You don't even have to deposit a ballot, right? So what I'm interested in is 
participation. And if people have an anti-system view, if they think these choices are all rotten, they ought to be able to express that. What's important is that they engage and express something. Okay. Certainly not capital R or capital D. I would be the last person to insist that every American should pick one, would I should have to pick one of those two options. Do we have to wait for, a, do we have to wait for a rise in corporate social responsibility for a chance to override Citizens United? Uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> that's a very good question. I don't think corporate social responsibility will get us there. Um, I think that Citizens United is a, a big problem, but it kind of caps, it's a capstone or at least a case in a much longer process that uh, for many Supreme Court cases have said that money is a, akin to speech in different ways, political speech. So it's way before Citizens United, that's the problem. And so it would be difficult to reverse Citizens United, it would take a constitutional amendment at this point. And I guess I'm in favor uh, less of measures that try to block the money out of politics, like reversing Citizens United, and more in favor of measures that mobilize lots and lots of people. So John Sarbanes uh, um, has, a, has had a proposal for a long time that I really like, that small donor donations should get a six to one public money match. And so what that would encourage is for everybody who's running for office to talk to many, many people who can contribute a little bit because then the government would multiply that by six. And so I'm for things that, I'm for measures that encourage politicians to talk to and mobilize lots and lots of people rather than um, spend all of their energy on the $10,000 a plate dinner at which 10 people go to, right? So, um, so I think it's the, Mark Hanna is a famous uh, kingmaker, uh, democratic kingmaker from decades past. And he said, well, you know, there's only two important things in politics. And the first one is money, and I forget what the second one is. And um, so he thought the only important thing was money, but the second thing is people. And I think in this um, very, very unequal society that we have, it's very difficult to prevent that money from bleeding into political influence. But what you can do is create a countervailing power of hundreds of millions of Americans engaged in the political process. And so I, that's my money strategy. And that is a beautiful way to conclude this incredibly stimulating talk, which is still, I'm still feeling the, the anxiety of purgatory. However, I feel incredibly enlivened <laughs> by it nonetheless. Um, so thank you, Archon, so much for this. Thank you, audience members, for attending, especially if this is your first IHC event. We hope that you will all join us again. After you leave tonight's event, please take a minute to fill out the post-webinar survey uh, to let us know how you heard about the event and if you'd like to sign up to receive information on our future events. So good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone.